Uh, the topic today is contrast echocardiography, certainly a topic dear to my heart and many of you. And uh, we will go through all what it takes to generate an image and also all the applications of contrast echocardiography, which has, have evolved over the years. Um, contrast echo is unique, I think, whenever we talk about contrast in any imaging modality, because in echocardiography, as many of you know, uh, the contrast generation of the image and the enhancement of the image is not only predicated on the uh, imaging agent that we use, but also the settings of the ultrasound machine so that it can enhance it. And at times, if the wrong settings are, are put together, you may actually destroy the image and may not have the most pleasant image for you to be able to make your diagnostics or, or uh, any information that you may want to get from the uh, contrast echocardiogram. So let's start with... Uh, you know, saline contrast, which still has its major applications. And the major applications of saline contrast is to uh, evaluate any intracardiac or intrapulmonary shunting. And it takes advantage that, one, these are <clears throat> agitated saline, so microbubbles that are made from agitation. So they have air in them, and the shell is, is very, uh, very soft in a way, and they are large. So the average length could be between 8 and 10 microns, and at times uh, they could be even larger, so they get trapped in the pulmonary circulation. So if you take a look at, at uh, this individual here, you could see a nice patent foramen ovale, and I think it's very diagnostic because it is intermittent uh, uh, crossing of contrast from the interatrial septum down to the left uh, atrium and then left ventricle. See, it's slowing down now, and then with another... Uh, change in pressures between the right atrium and the left atrium it facilitates this, uh, you know, uh, shunting of, of micro bubbles. And I think that's very important for our diagnosis of patent foramen ovale. Uh, I would, you know, stress again that this is really the preferred way because you can have a Valsalva maneuver uh, in the best of circumstances, not during a transesophageal echocardiogram. There, the transesophageal echocardiogram echocardiogram is to identify the localization of it and the, the shape of the patent foramen ovale and exclude other entities, just like a small uh, atrial septal defect or the like. So uh, another, another application of it, if you need pulmonary artery pressures, uh, this is a great way to do that. And you could do it with agitated saline where you can enhance the TR jet and estimate pulmonary artery pressures. Yes, you could do that with the second generation or other generations of, of contrast. Uh, yes, a little more expensive, but you know, yes, you could do that, particularly if you're using the other contrast-enhancing agents to opacify the left ventricle, which is the prime indication for contrast. So if we put this in context, what we're dealing with are microbubbles, and indeed all of them are microbubbles that have a shell, and in it, there is uh, a gas, either air, when, when you do a, a agitated saline, if you will, uh, or the, you know, the field that, that has been uh, in the works for many, many years now, my goodness, almost 30 years, is the high molecular weight gas. And <clears throat> the shell in green has been also designed, uh, so the shell as well as the gas, designed to make these microbubbles smaller, so they can cross the pulmonary uh, circulation, not getting trapped in the pulmonary circulation, and also that can have a, withstand a longer duration, so you could actually image well and withstand even pressures on the left side where the left ventricle is, is generating very high pressure. So over the years, I think in, uh, in yellow here in the slide are the three agents that are approved in the United States and, and actually our lab uses the three agents and each one has you know certain different uh, properties than the others all of them actually are very effective very safe and uh, and look at the size of these micro bubbles we're talking about between 1.1 and 4.5 or so micro uh, micro uh, uh, meter if you will and the greens are the ones that are approved in other co in other uh, countries in the world 
And the last ones in, in white were uh, a lot of uh, money was spent in development. Unfortunately, they did not uh, you know, master a, uh, an approval from the, uh, the agencies. So basically, in the United States, we're dealing with three agents, Optison, Definity, and Lumison, uh, with, with their properties of gas as well as shell composition. So let's talk through the importance of contrast and some of the applications and some of the physical principles that you really need to know. One, we usually don't like to show such uh, uh, really uh, non-revealing echocardiograms on the left side, but indeed if you use contrast and appropriately, you could take an uninterpretable image into an interpretable one. Not only just interpret, but you can even measure ventricular size, thickness, even mass, uh, and, and ejection fraction. So it really converts a, an uninterpretable examination into one that can be interpreted. So very important is technical, okay? So some of these uh, contrast agents, and most of them actually are no, not prescribed to be diluted. We dilute them because uh, if, you in, if you inject a, a large bolus, very highly concentrated, just imagine the reflection of this ultrasound uh, into the agent. So it almost acts almost like calcium or a metal. And so if you inject it fast and with a large bolus without dilution, you may see early on a nice image, but later on a lot of attenuation. You'll see the border, but behind it, there will be a lot of black attenuation, all this ultrasound uh, energy that's coming in can, cannot penetrate it and is reflected at the surface. So let's go through this uh, example here. Uh, on, the, on the left here is your right ventricle. Now, interestingly enough, when you inject contrast, you're going to see mostly it's a, a sliver of this right ventricle early on. Why? Because the high concentration is in the right ventricle and the ultrasound beam is coming this way. So if the high concentration is here, you're not going to see much behind it. And after that comes in, the contrast will come through the pulmonary circulation, come through the left atrium, and come into the ventricle. Early on, you're going to see nice opacification, but gradually, because of the rapidity and the large bolus here, you're going to see attenuation all this area here, and you're going to see the contrast only here, right? So let's, let's play this image and see uh, how the contrast dissipates. And so it's now coming in into the left ventricle, very nice, right? But watch, if that contrast was highly concentrated and a large bolus, you're going to start seeing the attenuation that is less during systole. Why? Because you're rejecting quite a bit of this contrast. Now, I'm not seeing much behind it. Not that I'm not injecting enough. Actually, I'm injecting too much. It is highly concentrated. So all the contrast is reflected at this border. Most of the, why? Because the con intensity and the concentration is much larger below. So uh, let's go to the uh, next depiction of what we're talking about here. I know many of you know about what the mechanical index. MI is the mechanical index, which relates to the peak negative pressure divided by the square root of the frequency. And when you talk about contrast or the bubbles that are either generated or manufactured, uh, and this is the pulse waveform that is coming and exciting these uh, micro bubbles. In the negative wave, right, so you have negative pressure, this bubble will expand. So if you have a very high mechanical index, the expansion of this bubble is, is just too much for it to burst. And therefore, at high mechanical indices, you're not going to have much survival of these bubbles and you're going to destroy quite a bit of them, right? So uh, that's why you need to if you want to see quite a bit of contrast, your mechanical index has to be on the lower end as opposed to just regular imaging of echocardiograms. And this is a, an old depiction of the power using mechanical index. A high power mechanical index is greater than 1. Medium and low power of mechanical index is like 0.3, even 0.2, even 0.1, where you, what you're doing is just exciting these micro bubbles. You're not destroying much of them. At this high end, uh, yes, you're exciting them, but you're destroying at the same time. And in between, uh, there is a, you know, a, a range of survival and, and depiction of it. Remember now, is if you use a mechanical power of about 0.3 or so, 
the image, the regular image of the myocardium itself and the valves is quite a bit attenuated because you don't have as much power sent in to reflect back from, from uh, this myocardium. And uh, Okay, so let's take a look at some examples here. One is the example of the effect of mechanical index on contrast itself. And what I have here is just a few beats after a contrast in being injected and playing around with a mechanical index. Here the mechanical index starts with uh, at 1.5 and we're going to bring it down gradually so you'll have more and more survival of these contrasts and this contrast will nicely fill the whole ventricle. So let's do that. See, so watch now at the high mechanical index there are quite a bit of destruction early on here. And if I'm going to start decreasing it all the way down to 0 0.4, 0 0.5, it fills nicely the whole myocardium. Back at 1.5, and then you'll have less and less destruction the more I bring the mechanical index down. So whenever you see a picture like this, given by either during the sonographer taking it or you interpreting the study, you have to say to yourself, I first look at the mechanical index because it looks like, almost like a hurricane. You're not filling the whole vent right there. You're not filling the whole ventricle. So therefore, it's not like you don't have enough contrast. You're just destroying it. And the way you know you have enough contrast is by looking down at the left atrium. The left atrium is really full, right? So uh, that's what tells you that you're destroying much more than you're, uh, and it's not a contrast penia, if you will, right? is you have enough contrast, but you're destroying it much more. Uh, that's, these are examples here again. A nice example of telling you two things. One, I have a high mechanical index of 1.1. Watch that I'm destroying quite a bit in the near field here, right? So it's almost like a hurricane. Also, what it tells me here, you have attenuation behind. So the concentration of contrast is coming is very high, and I'm destroying the vast majority in the apex itself. So what we need to do is obviously bring down this mechanical index to something that is in the 0 0.3, 0 0.2 range or 0.4 at most range, okay? So the nice thing about many of the uh, imaging uh, machines nowadays is they are preset with contrast settings, so it brings down the mechanical index. But if you play around with it, you will you know, accentuate, you know, these, uh, these effects of interaction of mechanical index with the contrast itself. Interestingly enough, you know, the phenomenon of resonance, second harmonic, imaging at second harmonic was initially popularized and actually investigated using contrast, not just regular harmonics of, of the myocardium itself where we know you have less reverberations and, and artifacts with it. But a second harmonic is whenever you send a certain frequency or emit a certain frequency, either when you hit the ultrasound uh, crystals with energy or hit, if you're a guitar player, you hit your string with, a, uh, with your uh, fingers or so, it will emit a certain sound. If you hit it harder enough, right, it will hit, emit either second or third harmonics of those. So if you want to simulate that, ping is your fundamental frequency. Frequency, And if you hit it harder, you'll have ping, wing, 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 the, other, the other harmonics that may come to it. And you may have ultra harmonic at 0.5 range. And the beauty is, and the taking advantage is, if, if you want to image at second harmonic, conceivably, you will you will enhance the imaging of contrast itself. And we're going to go through this, meaning if I only image at fundamental, okay, the effect of contrast itself may not be as impressive to your eye, it may not differentiate it as much from the myocardium per se. So let's take an example here, okay? And this example here at the beginning is we're Im imaging with fundamental, okay? Contrast is filled. I barely can differentiate the myocardium from the contrast itself, right? So, and it, on this machine setting, it says 3.5 megahertz. And what you're gonna see a difference, you're gonna see H, 3.5 megahertz, meaning when the harmonic is turned on. So just a flip of a, of a tab to go from 
fundamental to harmonic and notice the difference in the image per se. When you go to harmonic, you're going to emphasize so much the contrast effect. Watch, boom, right now. So my intensity of contrast, although I'm imaging at, at harmonics, right, is so much more from contrast. And now I can differentiate so much nicer the LV cavity from the border of the myocardium. So again, most machine settings are already set for harmonics. Actually, most of our imaging nowadays is some, done with harmonics, so we have lesser of that issue. But you need to understand that because, again, these are machine settings for the same contrast that will change the depiction of how the image is and how good the image is, okay? All right, so, so what are, I mean, from now on, we're gonna talk about clinical evaluations and potential applications. We, I'm gonna uh, mostly, uh, you know, emphasize the endocardial border definition, and this is actually what contrast is approved for, is approved for enhancement of the endocardial border definition when you don't see something well. Enhancement of Doppler signal, this is not a prime indication, but we use it because, you know, it can enhance your signal. Myocardial perfusion, uh, the, there is a code for myocardial perfusion. It has not been approved for myocardial perfusion. And therapeutic still in the experimental side, and, and we're not going to uh, spend too much time on that. Uh, there has been on the on the bottom is actually is the update of the first. So the first document from the American Society of Echo was about 12 years ago by Sharon Mulvey and Al, and we were involved in that. And this is two years ago, the update of clinical applications of ultrasound enhancing agents. And we're changing the terminology to ultrasound enhancing agents. You can still call it contrast, but that's what we really mean by that. And that's what's uh, you know, being discussed and written in the literature nowadays. And this is a list, basically, so if you go back, we're enhancing the signal, right? Enhancing, uh, uh, improving visualization of the ventricle. So uh, that's number one, improvement of assessment of regional and global function. With that comes delineation of hypertrophy. With that comes rescue of uninterpretable studies. Stress echocardiography, not yet a prime indication, but you could see why would be important. Doppler signals. Definition of structural abnormalities, thrombus, pseudoaneurysm. Now you look at flow for pseudoaneurysm, trying to, to understand that. So basically, tracking flow and the border between flow and a structure, right? And this is what that, that we're talking about here. And if you look at the appropriateness criteria from the various organizations, uh, routine use of contrast, if all the segments are visualized, it's certainly inappropriate to see that. And at times you may see shadowing that may, may hinder some of the imaging. But you want to use it appropriately when you don't see enough of, of the ventricle and you need assessment of ventricular function. So that's going to be very important. You know, I show you this and we could show many examples, right? As I always ask people, you know, estimate what your ejection fraction is and what your wall motion is. Most people would not venture. I would not venture into that. And it's, it sends a, a uh, recommendation to people who are not using contrast at all in the laboratory. Uh, it really will change. It's almost like turning the light on an uninterpretable study to quite an interpretable study. So this is the same patient after contrast. So don't tough it out. And unfortunately, the reimbursement is the same. If I say technically difficult study cannot interpret versus actually now I, I can interpret it. And I think we should be the stewards of quality. We should be all the directors and also the laboratory sonographers as well as physicians interpreting should be the stewards of giving the best interpretation, the best data from studies that we do. And therefore, appropriate use of contrast echo should be really part of every laboratory. The good thing is that IAC, the accreditation body, has mandated that laboratories would have prospects of how to have contrast in their laboratories, how to, you know, all, all the processes that are needed. So I think this is really very important. Well, I'll show this, this example for you too. You need to take a look at that. And uh, I can't ask you questions directly now if uh, we're in a live audience, but you take a look at this. 
and you tell me how much can you see from this and what interpretation you're going to be able to tell. I can tell you what I, what I can venture in, that the ventricle is depressed, uh, maybe some regional wall motion abnormalities. I cannot tell the anterior wall. Uh, and yes, I'm going to say, you know, dip, very depressed ventricular function. The descent of the base is also depressed, right? So let's see what contrast tells us. Uh, contrast will enhance the imaging overall. And there is a surprise, obviously, a thrombus at the tip of this heart uh, with a negative contrast in it. And also I can tell what the interior wall and all, it looks like a diffuse abnormally heart with some areas of akinesis, but certainly there isn't a single segment that can't contracts well at all. Let's take another example here. All right, what can you tell about this heart? I can tell that's most likely is quite vigorous. That's, all, that's the only thing I can tell. I cannot tell the thickness of this heart or anything else. And actually, this heart has a, a hyper, is a hypertrophic heart with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if you take a look at that, the septum is quite impressively thickened, uh, maybe even small trapping of the apical chamber, and certainly very hyperdynamic. So, yes, I was right on ventricular function, but I was not correct on what the underlying pathology is. This is an example that I use all the time because it's hard to reproduce. Um, and I remember I was directly involved in it, and I always say that. Um, this is probably 10 years plus old, uh, even more than that, is I interpret the study as normal, okay? And I'm giving you the best pictures that I can see. And Dr. Kleiman, our interventional director, said, there's no way it can be normal. The electrocardiogram shows an infarct. And uh, can you please do something? So we brought the patient back and used contrast. And the interesting thing, as you can see, is that there is a very unusual localization of what turns out to be an aneurysm in the lateral wall. So this is a four-chamber view. Uh, and, uh, and you could see that you could see where the sac is. So apically, it's fine. But this is a very unusual. And what did the eye do for my eye, and hopefully also many of your eyes, is that it interpolated this area and said, well, if everything else around it is normal, we'll interpolate it, and most likely it is normal. Another case, a very abnormal electrocardiogram, somebody coming in with chest discomfort, and that's what you see on this echocardiogram. Uh, hard to tell the endocardial border, I don't know about the apex per se, maybe abnormal, but certainly if I marry it with the electrocardiogram, it is very, very abnormal. And well, this is a nice example of entrapment and an apical uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy on this individual coming in with chest pain. So it changed the diagnosis in this individual. All right, another case. It's important to, to go through some cases just also to show you the impact of contrast. Four chamber and two chamber on this individual, and I can tell a few things. One, that there is an inferior base akinesis, completely akinesis. So there is regional abnormalities on this heart. The other areas are not too impressive to me. I cannot say more really about it. And watch what the contrast tells me in this situation, okay? It tells me that there is a wall motion abnormality in the apex, and on top of that, there is an apical thrombus. I really missed this completely without contrast echocardiography. So that's the enhancement of not only the diagnosis, but at times changing the therapeutics. And we'll talk about that, the change in the therapeutics down the line. Take a look at this case, okay? And go through your mind of what you would say about this parasternal long and apical four chamber of this case. What can you say? Well, the first thing, okay, is that there isn't much motion, at least the epicardial portion of this heart. I cannot see inside. I'm suspicious of some abnormality inside, but I cannot tell for sure, right? And what it is, it's a very extensive apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, you could see the intramural uh, arterioles that are coming in because they're large and have a lot of flow, a lot of flow. The clue from here, as you, if you go back, is if you have no epicardial motion 
either there is a wall motion abnormality inside here, right? Or you have a lot of hypertrophy and there isn't much place for the uh, endocardium to move further inward into this situation. So please, if you see something like this, you have to use contrast to enhance what you did. So I want to show a, a, a screen, a quad screen or even a nine screen. And I want you to uh, make a guess as to what the two things that I told you about today from a technical point of view you're seeing. Yes, we're seeing the thrombus in this patient. But there are two examples down here for you. If you're sharp enough by now to say what are the two effects that you see, okay? Well, I will interpret it now for you, is here you have a lot of contrast with shadowing. So it's not that I'm ha not having enough contrast. Actually, either the injection of contrast was too fast or the dilution was not too much. So I'm seeing very nicely here, and all this is shadowed. And what did this individual sonographer do from here to here? What did they do? because it looks very different now. And this is sequential. What they did is they increased the mechanical index to try to destroy more of the contrast. And what you ended up with, a lot of destruction, right? So we have a lot of destruction, almost like a hurricane heart when you see that, meaning some of the contrasts that are coming in being destroyed. So a high mechanical index, low mechanical index with a high bolus injection. So hopefully you enjoyed that portion. This is for enhancement of aortic stenosis. We're not asking this for you to do it on every case, certainly. It, 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 it would be the unusual case where sonographer has tried uh, to get a nice jet of aortic stenosis, and here it's not very nicely displayed. And after enhancement, you could see a nice enhancement of the aortic stenosis jet. You gotta be careful. If you have too much contrast, it will enhance it too much, and you'll have almost a half a meter or so extra, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say uh, just over uh, signal, if you will. So you have to wait for it to die down a little bit so you don't overestimate the velocity and therefore gradient. So you have to be careful about that. So potential impact of contrast, stress echocardiography. In the outpatient setting, this is an old slide and I kept it because it's still there. The least probably is in the outpatient, more in the inpatient's ICU setting and stress echocardiography where it can change quite a bit. This is from an old study that we did in the ICU where you didn't see more than half of the uh, segments. We used harmonic initially, harmonic and contrast and compared it to TEE. Harmonic and contrast was almost as good at transesophageal in evaluating wall motion and ventricular function overall. Stress echocardiography, I mentioned it is not a, a current FDA-approved indication, although obviously we use it because to enhance contrast and uh, enhance wall motion and improve interpretation. You can see this individual here with a nice abnormal wall motion. Uh, advice for you, decide on contrast at the beginning of your stress echocardiogram, so not to have non-contrast images versus contrast images. I think this is gonna be very important for your overall interpretation. Utilization in the United States, a nice range of zero to 100%, I think is still valid, truly, because some laboratories are not using it at all. Some laboratories are almost mandating it. I think the truth lies somewhere in between because if you mandate it on images that are pristine, you may have degradation of images. And here, if you do zero, you're missing a lot on, on good accuracy. Who are the patients who benefit? Is it cost effective? This is uh, the optimized trial that we did, a randomized trial, we're not gonna do this again, randomized trial for dobutamine echocardiography. So patients get two stress echoes, two dobutamine stress echoes, one with and one without contrast. And this was by Juan Carlos Plano when he was a fellow with us, published in Jack Imaging. Notice few things, visualization of segments. Non-contrast versus contrast, better at rest, continues good during stress, and we know that with stress you have some decrement in, in visualization, right? Watch here, agreement with coronary disease with angiography. If you have more than two segments that are not visualized, the agreement with angiography without contrast is really poor. 
There are a lot of guessing game. Now, if you have one or two segments or all segments are visualized, the agreement is, is actually quite decent. And this is for coronary angiography. I'll share with you one example here. You tell me, if you don't use contrast, how you interpret this study. This is from that study per se. 5, milligram, 5 microgram, 10 microgram, and max. You tell me if there is ischemia, what the function is, where are the abnormalities of this heart. And this is not a rarity. You're going to see this from time to time, depending on body habitus, if they speak, speak uh, smoke, or, or other things, right? Uh, I may be able to tell that there's maybe an apical wall motion abnormality. Notice the difference here. One thing is at rest, I have a wall motion abnormality already in the apex. So this individual had a previous anterior myocardial infarction. On top of that, at maximal dobutamine, the ventricle has enlarged extension of the wall motion abnormality in there, and I'm not showing you all the views. Certainly, this is somebody with a previous infarct and is still quite a bit of ischemia, peri-infarction, which changes basically your diagnosis significantly here. So this is really very important for you. And the reason I mentioned that, uh, you know, don't use contrast all the time. And I think in our experience, you'll find out is about maybe 60%, 70% of the time, et cetera, is you also have to be careful on some of the artifacts that you may see with contrast. Whenever you see a linear structure like this, particularly with contrast, you know that there is an issue with it. There's an artifact. There's either attenuation. See this? There's an attenuation from an area here that is hyper-enhancing, and the, actually the endocardium is right here behind it. Same thing here, the endocardium is behind it. Your eye can be fooled if you only look at this shadow. So you're gonna be very careful about this. And this is actually an example where you have ischemia in the inferior wall and the shadow is just from the papillary muscle area. There's another also linear shadow on this side. So be very careful, there's another shadow right here. So this is where the endocardium is on the right side. So I can't emphasize this enough. So contrast in stress, it improves endocardial visualization improved accuracy, reproducibility. Uh, in our experience, the ranges between f the utilization should be between 50 and 80 percent, depending on the population. Mostly is, are you going to get good images when you stress this individual and you, you make that determination on the rest image? And, uh, and you have to reposition your transducer to get the best images you know, going forward. What is the impact in resting studies? And this is a study that by Dr. Kurt, who came to us from uh, Turkey. Uh, a, a really a very nice study that, that he did on 630 some uh, consecutive patients where we asked the question whether contrast will change management. This is a resting study, not stress, published in Jack. And uh, in yellow are uninterpretable studies. You couldn't, you couldn't interpret anything. In red is technically difficult studies, okay? So by design, it was technically difficult studies in the vast majority, and the sonographer basically made that determination of when to use contrast. And after contrast, we had a sliver on uninterpretable studies in the surgical intensive care unit, uh, a higher percentage compared to others. It's still technically difficult studies, so it doesn't eliminate that. But notice the major change that the vast majority now becomes interpretable, okay? Inpatient ward, MICU, SICU, and the outpatient setting, and this is the total, okay? Let's take a look at the impact. And what we asked the physician is, we gave them the result of the study without contrast, what would you do next for that particular patient? And we gave them the result after contrast and said, what would you do? Okay, so the, the most impact was in the intensive care units. This is surgical intensive care unit where TE was avoided in about a third of the cases to assess ventricular function, nuclear imaging to assess ventricular function, so the, ma the vast majority, about 60%, had a lot of impact. A little less in the medical intensive care unit, a little less still, but about 30% or so in the inpatient ward, and the outpatient the least, because we know these are ambulatory, not instrumented, you know, healthier individuals. 
Now, what kind of impact besides what we talked about is medication changes. So some had hemodynamic drug started because the ventricular function was poor. Hemodynamic drug stopped because it was hyperdynamic. Anticoagulation stopped because we suspected there was a thrombus or started because there was a thrombus. So this is the total impact in the surgical intensive care unit, about 60% or so. Medical intensive care unit, almost similar to inpatient ward, about you know, 35 to 40% or so. And in the outpatient setting, uh, impact of about 12%, 13% or so. So that's, now also we asked, I asked Dr. Kurt to do this analysis, which made sense. If I had two to six segments not seen, seven to 11 segments not seen, greater than 12, the impact is almost 100% if I don't see anything. Uh, and it's you know, less and less if I see more and more of the ventricle, okay? And let's take some examples here. You decide, okay, Where are, wherever you are. Is this thrombus or is this reverberation? Okay, I don't have a way to poll you, but you make that decision. I don't know if you're surprised. I was personally surprised, but there's no thrombus. Okay, let's take another case. Thrombus versus trabeculations. You decide. It seems to me like trabeculations. <laughs> However, that's what you see. It is a definite thrombus in the apex. How about another case? Thrombus versus reverberations. And I'm, say, I'm showing you, I mean, obviously, if you're doing it alone, you have to do short access of the apex, do different things, and you, you tried your best to do this, but still was hard to tell. Huh. What do you think? Quite a change in diagnosis, and it looks like multilobular as well as in therapeutics in this individual. So quite a bit of, quite a, bit of a change. And last, I think in the last few slides, We'll touch upon myocardial perfusion because it's interesting. People have done, and we have done, years of research in this area. We still don't, I mean, we have a, a modifier for CMS for, for billing, but to tell you the truth, we're not using this. We use a lot of research. It's great for research, but from a clinical point of view, it has some issues. But let, let's go through some principles. So we talked about opacifying the ventricle, et cetera, and enhancing the Doppler signals. But now if you're looking at flow, in the myocardial vasculature, you're looking at flow within these tiny capillaries as well as the venules. It's not gonna differentiate capillaries from venules in a way because this is whole myocardium, right? So contrast is it's passing by, it's very tiny microbubbles, so it's not obstructing in that area. And we talked about that it depends on how much you're gonna see, depends on how much energy you send through this transducer. So if I'm using continuous regular imaging the myocardium is dark because why? Because the flow within these capillaries is very slow. So it's exposed to it a little too long. It destroys most of it. And that's why if I use continuous imaging at a mechanical index that is not too low, I'm going to destroy most of it. And I'm going to enhance mostly the ventricular portion of it. Nice delineation. Here, if I do intermittent imaging, so I let the contrast come in, not be destroyed, look at how much enhancement I have in the myocardium compared to the, to the cavity itself. And this is where some of the, all the research and all the work that was done, quite a few from Dr. Sanjeev Cole, Kevin Way, Jonathan Lindner, uh, Tom Porter, uh, ourselves, we did quite a bit of that with Jorge Sharif, and myself and our fellows. And uh, I think this is the principle. The principle is if I destroy sending a, a little brief high mechanical index and then image either intermittently or with a low mechanical index, I can see this contrast coming in into the myocardium and I can tell few things. The rate of rise, it tells me the myocardial blood flow into the area, how fast it is coming. And this is myocardial blood volume wherever it, it gets to a steady state situation. And this is from Kevin Way early work when they were in 
uh, University of Virginia. And you know, there was software to do this. So real-time imaging, bubble, you have to bubble preserve. You have to use low mechanical index so you don't destroy them or a slow frame rate so that also you don't destroy them or image intermittently. And this is an example, low MI, I can fill it very nicely. I send a high MI briefly, very briefly to destroy all the micro bubbles and then I can watch them back in and therefore look at perfusion. And I'll show you an example from our early work here. Um, and this is at baseline. We're going to send a high mechanical index. You could see how dark it is, and gradually it will fill. Okay? And then with dipyramol, so high flow, there's a little tachycardia with it. And at the same time, a little high mechanical index is going to come in shortly. And then here you go. And then watch it fill gradually. And you see the difference between the base as well as the apex where the wall motion abnormality is present in addition to perfusion defect. Why do we have some issues with it? Because there is some attenuation here. We don't see as well in the base of the heart as opposed to the apex and apical cavities. So, I mean, there are issues, a lot of variability, and that's why, and it, it is laborious, I would say. It's great for a research tool because you could look at flow at different times and after various interventions, right? And it is rather safe. So uh, th that's the beauty of it, but also we have to be realistic. There are a lot of competing methodologies for, for blood flow, including SPECT, PET, right, and, uh, and, and many, and CMR also. So we have to also be realistic regarding blood flow and, and the competing technology to, for this to be a, uh, a prime use uh, of, of contrast echo with contrast. So these are, you know, summaries of previous data, sensitivity and specificity, you know, within, within the ballpark. But currently, we don't have an indication for it. And we could use it also for vascular imaging, uh, looking at maybe stents and contrast around stents and uh, perfusion and uh, vasovasorum, right? Take a look at that. And there are some research regarding that, that uh, these are maybe active plaques and the carotids. Uh, but we're not going to go through that. I'm just, you know, giving you a flavor of where it could be. Also, there's a lot of work from Dr. Tom Porter's uh, laboratory and some clinical trials regarding lysis with ultrasound because of the energy that uh, in acute myocardial infarctions. Still, research, not a prime indication. So we wanted to concentrate on things that could be helpful in your laboratories, be it sonographers or clinicians. So in conclusions and future direction, uh, Bullet number one, I think we're done much better. Now, you know, we've been in this field for years, and I think uh, we have education is there, is permeating in various laboratories, and the utilization, appropriate utilization of these technologies have really increased over time, and I, I can see that in, in many laboratories. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm confident that most people would use these contrast agents appropriately in the indications that we talked about, which really can, can enhance so much our uh, quality of the studies as well as the interpretation, which has important clinical implications of therapeutics and further diagnostics and many other things. And remember, ECHO, irrespective of what you do, is a first-line diagnostic modality for us to treat and take care of patients with cardiac disease. Two is um, where I would like to see some of that is in, in 3D echocardiography. Now remember in 3D, you're gonna have more energy delivered in 3D to the contrast itself. So you're gonna have more utilization and more destruction of contrast. So I think that that would be important to enhance its utilization and optimization in those areas where we use 3D to assess, hopefully with automation, ventricular size and function, so 3D volumes and, and function, and maybe see where we could use it in strain imaging. And I, I haven't seen much of that, so if many of our colleagues in, in the industry are, are, are watching, these are the two areas that we could use with 3D, even with, with 2D for, for strain imaging. TEs, now that we have harmonic, we could use that. Interestingly enough, for TE, uh, the shadowing is obviously towards the ventricle, so you have to 
uh, you know, use that appropriately and understand how to use it. For perfusion, uh, no, I mean, there is a utilization code. Uh, uh, I don't know what the latest on the utilization code, but to me, I think contrast for pure perfusion away from wall motion per se, it, it is not realistic. You have to couple it with it, knowing that they have much more limitations in perfusion imaging as opposed to wall motion. Although some you know, experts would disagree with that, but that's my personal opinion. Rhone in Synapeutics gene uh, delivery, I think Dr. Grayburn has done quite a bit of work at, uh, in, in Dallas regarding delivery uh, because uh, you could actually destroy many of these micro bubbles that may have you know, gene carrying capacity on, on the shell and deliver it uh, you know, focally through an intra-arterial injection or something like this to do, to do that. Uh, thrombolysis we talked about and some exploration in vascular imaging and vasovasorum work, uh, you know, particularly in carotids, vulnerable plaque, other things. So I think this is what I have for you. I want to thank you for, uh, for your attention. And I, what we can do is, one, the people on Zoom can ask questions and we can have an interaction that everybody can, can hear. At the same time, if, we can, if you can send your uh, text, your questions to, uh, to the site, uh, I think that would be great. Okay, for those of you on Zoom, one by one, probably uh, un unmute yourself so we can talk. Okay, any questions from our Zoom colleagues? I can see some uh, various names there, but I don't hear any questions so far. Maybe Dr. Little. I can see you, Dr. Little. <laughs> I do have a question. <laughs> I, I just wanted you to uh, comment slash clarify about contrast for Doppler um, augmentation. When to do it, when not to do it, risks, benefits, because that seems to be an area of some confusion out there. Yes. Uh, and I know also, uh, Steve, you've done quite a bit of work on this, and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dimitri and uh, many of your colleagues, many of your fellows that were with you. But th there is a caution. Just like you can enhance imaging, right, you can enhance the Doppler signal. Marjan, can you wait a little bit? <laughs> Um, so, if early on in the enhancement process, those signals can be quite enhanced. They can be quite enhanced. And, uh, and, uh, and you may over, over trace or over emphasize the velocity. So, you may have, I wouldn't say mirror imaging, but just uh, a stronger signal. And in, in my experience, it can increase the velocity of about, about almost half a meter per second. And you, you have to tell me in aortic stenosis, but I know in TR, tricuspid regurgitation, you can enhance it almost like half a meter. Now, if, so the recommendation is, one, if you have a good signal to start with, don't enhance it. Meaning I have a good edge in aortic stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation or whatever signal that you're looking at, don't enhance it. If, if it is broken, and if I, I can, I've tried every window to it, and I still cannot really see what the peak velocity, what the envelope is like, I would enhance it with the least amount of contrast. And the sonographer, they, they're going to take the pictures and take the recordings, and maybe early on it will be too much, and then wait for it to die down a little bit so that you can still see the shape but not over enhance it. I mean, th these are my recommendations and obviously I welcome, you know, your input because you've done quite a bit of research on it. Uh, on mood, no, I, I would completely agree. I think the, uh, the application that seems best suited is still TR where you have incomplete jets uh, and that's where you usually get an incomplete jet or if you're gonna see an incomplete jet, that's where it is. You rarely see an incomplete aortic stenosis jet. Yes. Um, so there is a, a notion that you can augment 
a complete aortic stenosis jet, and you will usually get a higher velocity with contrast. And then the question is, well, which one is real? And I would caution against that, and the reason for it, the reason for it is we know from the days uh, of Rick Nishimura and Mayo Clinic, early, early validation, early, early validation of relation of, of Doppler to hemodynamics. That even if we take the higher speckles of contrast, right, just above the, uh, the jet itself, that you will overestimate instantaneous gradients or peak-to-peak -peak gradients. So I would caution against that because then you will overestimate severity by gradients and valve area derivation. Very good. Other questions? Dr. Zogby, this is uh, Raghumupiri from Baytown. Yes. Uh, you know, in terms of day-to-day uh, -day use, contraindications-wise, if there is any shunts, especially if there's a large right-to-left shunt, I mean, that's contraindicated. But what about if there's a small PFO or, uh, uh, you know, like a small bidirectional kind of PFO? Would, would you still use it? Yes, I, th I think... You know, unless uh, you know, most, of the con most of the earlier contraindications have been, you know, taken away because of experience and large registry data. So uh, we don't screen for PFOs anymore. Uh, obviously, if the question, Dr. Mopidi, is number one, is there a PFO, yes or no? The second generation, the ones we talked about, is not the indication. Okay? So, and if you want to use... If you want to use two things, for example, right? If I want to use, uh, I want to exclude a PFO because clinically that's important, but at the same time, I'm not seeing well the left ventricle, right? The suggestion is use saline contrast first, right? To okay. see whether there is any shunting, yes or no. And determine that with or without Valsalva and everything else, I'm done with it. Then you could use, you know, the second generation contrast that will cross the pulmonary circulation and enhance the left ventricle. So going back to your question, truly no contraindication of, uh, of, of uh, unless you have an allergic response and on the first, you know, the first trial, you won't know if people have not been exposed to it. But the other contraindications that we had for high pulmonary pressure, a PFO, uh, various things gradually the black box have have been taken away from that okay thank you so use it appropriately guys i think all of you if you're not seeing well the left ventricle to interpret regional global function this is the indication approved by the fda and this is very cost effective we looked at cost effectiveness because if you can't interpret then you have to go either guess clinically what you're going to do or use another modality that may be even more expensive. So use it appropriately. Other questions? Yes, we don't know what kind of perk. We might have to transfer more money because, okay, you want to pay the fee. What do you want to transfer? Okay. What are you anticipating to transfer? Can you, can you, all right. right. Any, any questions that were sent by, uh, all right. Sounds good. Well, with that, we thank you for your attendance and uh, stay safe. Thanks, Dr. Zink.